Hi, friends. Take three of your honest going live in Taurus. <laughs> and now we have take four. Take three of the ninth holy night, which is Uranus going retrograde in tw at 24 degrees Taurus. So here we go. It's very Uranian that we're ha that all this energy is exploding through the space and making it challenging to get going. So I'm going to take a deep breath and make room for the energy that's Uranus to come through. So here we are. So Uranus um, goes retrograde at 24 degrees Taurus at the same time that Mercury, Jupiter, and Venus are all also changing direction, which we're not going to discuss those tonight. We're just going to discuss Uranus going retrograde. But it's just something you can put as a duly noted for yourself that around this time, this is what will be happening. So it's one of the most powerful moments of the year. And I'm beginning, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Anne Fetter. I'm a certified soul level astrologer. I was certified through a two-and-a-half-year study program in the College of Visionary Wizards, where I, Visionaries and Wizards, where I studied with Mark Borak, who um, created Soul Level Astrology. And he created Soul Level Astrology from another system of astrology known as Star Genesis. The progenitor of Star Genesis is Elias Lonsdale, who's my astrological grandfather. And I'm very honored to be sharing with you tonight. I'm going to be reading from a transcript from Elias about the Twelve Holy Nights. So without further ado, here we go. So first to build it up a little bit, Uranus is the planet of internal vision, of clairvoyance, of the light dawning within. That's from Elias. And for me, um, Uranus is the planet that wants to take our most evolved consciousness and evolve it further. So you Imagine the most evolved part of yourself and then imagine it evolving further. And that's the planet Uranus. And, and we're back to the transcript. And as we'll see during the next half hour, when that happens, we have a whole different relation to Uranus than is collectively common. Meaning when we let the light dawn within, when we let Uranus do actually what Uranus wants to do, it changes our collective vision. In the collective sense of Uranus, really, it's about a kind of an astral excitation, an electrifying state of mind that pulls you out into a very suggestible and impressionable state of consciousness and makes you want more, makes you go further. Typically, it's almost a quantitative, somewhat external way. And the point is, to turn it into something qualitative and interior. And I'm going to contextualize this again because Elias speaks about this over and over again in his writings about how most people actually aren't able to go anywhere with Uranus because they make it very external. And he's making the point here that the only way to really deeply work with Uranus is to do it from a very internal space. Now, that degree that Uranus is going retrograde in, 24 degrees Taurus, the Chandra symbol of that degree is a man with no mouth. A man with no mouth. I've spoken about this degree before, but it comes out differently every time. The man with no mouth realizes that it's not something to talk about. It's not even something to think about. It's not something to prepare for or have perfect or to have a whole trip about. That the Uranian journey is something to enter upon directly and it will speak to us. It will activate us. It will take us where we need to go. My experience with Uranus, having it directly overhead at birth, having it dominate my life since the end of the 1960s, my experience with Uranus, is that there is an internal imperative with it. And again, this is Anne, and I'm going to um, add some meaning to this or some more understanding, is that when when Elias said he had Uranus overhead at birth, Uranus, Elias has Uranus conjunct his crown of his chart, the midheaven of his chart, almost exactly. So when he says it's influencing him, that is very true. It is what is coming into him at all times, and it's part of what makes Elias Lonsdale 
the astrological wizard and the clairvoyant seer that he is, is that he has Uranus at his crown and he's consistently and constantly working with that planet. So he knows this energy very deeply, more deeply than me. And I am going to do my best once again to just let this be able to come through. The imperative is, that we strip away what the outer mental has told us and get all the way down inside of what the interior intuitive knowingness is wanting to reveal to us. We are all familiar with this language. If we're involved with the stars, it's a common language. Uranus is the one that's most known really of the outer planets and where the general idea is correct. And I'm going to parse that. And what Elias is essentially saying here is of the outer planets and the way that Western astrology views them, he's saying Uranus is the most known and it's the one that Western astrology has the closest to being accurate according to his understanding of the planets. However, as far as actually going through the inner developmental stages to become awake and aware in a Uranian mode, that's something else again. Initially, I'll do this autobiographically because I think it's most effective and also that's really where I am right now. It's time for that. So initially for me, just before my 1969 sudden escalation and acceleration of everything Uranian, just before that, I was picking up on and in the culture around me that there were all these people in my generation Oh, my speaker or my mic is rubbing against my hair. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Let me fix that. Let's see if we can get this to behave itself. Is that better? Just pop a comment in. Thank you. Um, just before my 1969 sudden escalation and acceleration of everything Iranian, just before that, I was picking up on and in the culture around me that there were all these people in my generation, in the baby boomer generation, who were coming alive, who were waking up, who were having inward journeys, who were seeing things that nobody had seen before. And I was extremely excited about it and thrilled with it and drawn toward it. And at the same time, I had huge caution about it for all the reasons that people usually do. Um, and someone who's doing right now, will you let me know if my sound is better now that I made that adjustment or if I need to make an another, another adjustment? I would so appreciate that. My worldly mind, which was very strong in my first 22 years, really had, well, was revolted by the idea that I would actually become a truly Iranian vessel in whatever form. That was too much. That would mean that I was exposed, that I was committed, that I was taking a journey that anything could happen. So he's giving us a hint here about Uranus. He's saying, if I become totally hooked into Uranus, I know it means anything could happen. And I didn't want to do it. I would be on some psychedelic substance and I would have a great time. And then afterwards, I would act like that was a journey of its own and that I was back in the regular world, just like so many people did. And so I was, you know, doing the usual dance about Uranus. And then all that changed suddenly when I was in this commune, which was a cult, which was everything. And I've talked about this in so many ways. And I'll just say one thing about it right now, which is we were exceedingly telepathic. We were telepathic to the point of most of our communication was that way. And since almost all of us were intellectuals and were very bright and were coming from a background that was always talking, always thinking, always in that consciousness vein that people feed on, the fact that we were actually living from a telepathic place was the single most compelling aspect of the entire situation. And there were a lot of extraordinary things. But that's what got to us. It's certainly what got to me because I had been feeling when I was living in Boston just before all this, I'd been feeling how cut off I was from everybody else 
and that nobody was really there with each other and nobody was there with me and I was devastated by it. And so to be in this telepathic connection with all these people at the same time felt to me to be the entry point into the new world, which in fact it was. It was very much that way. So what was it about this telepathy? And grounding this now a little further, not talking generalities, cultural generalities, but what was it about this telepathy that really meant so much to me? Well, I discovered, and this was a continuous discovery, I discovered that who I really was, was living inside of myself was not this outer person that I was used to and that who I really was had all these ways of communicating with everybody else that didn't depend on the faulty methods of words. And for me, that was just so spacious, such an empowerment. And then what happened was when I left that group, I retained my Iranian telepathic abilities even more so. And I started to then get into the stars. And I started to get into all kinds of cosmic spiritual things. But the point was that I had been, my mind had been altered. And I had learned how to stay with that. And so I would continuously be able to read people's minds, which I'd always been good at, but not seriously. It would come and go. Now, it was almost a staple of my life. I could read people's minds. I could let them into my mind. I could participate in group consciousness. It's always about group consciousness in which there was something so much more going on than meets the eye. And I could evolve. I could awaken. I could constantly evolve and awaken. I could keep changing and growing and shifting and becoming. And that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It was, I was thrilled. It didn't even matter to me if all kinds of other challenges were happening, which of course they were. They always are. That was what it was all about. And I even got involved with people who were pretty strange, but they were telepathic. And so it would be like that was enough. That was more than enough just to have that rapport, that camaraderie, that wink that knowingness, that direct sense. Now, here we go. What is that really, really all about? I'm going to put it now in Uranus and Taurus terms, the ones that we're in these days. It means that we have a hunger and thirst in our being, in our knowing being, in the one who sees, the one who is in the light. We have this hunger and thirst and longing and yearning for connection, but most of all, for going further in our own awareness. And that state doesn't need words, doesn't need a mouth, doesn't need any outer framework at all. It doesn't need to be proven. It doesn't need to be validated. It doesn't need to be secure or stable. All it needs is to be on a trajectory that is so free and clear that we can follow it with our whole being and we can set ourselves this task. Putting it in Uranus and Taurus terms, the task we set ourselves is to get to know this person inside who it always turns out that we don't know them yet. We don't know who we are yet. I'm going to read that sentence again because it's quite powerful. Putting it in Uranus and Taurus terms, the task we set ourselves is to get to know the person inside who it always turns out that we don't know them yet. We don't know who we are yet. So I'm going to pause there and say, imagine if we all, if we all, realize we don't know who we are yet like what a way to begin the new year what if the whole world imagined we don't know who we are and let's find out and then let's find out again and let's find out again and let's find out again and let's get to know ourselves deeper and deeper and more 
and more. And there you can begin to feel in the way that I'm speaking also that energy of Uranus that wants to go further and deeper and deeper and further and further and deeper and deeper and further. Uranus never stops. And that, back to the transcript, this and that being, this we don't know who we are yet, and that being this extraordinary essence is a wonderful thing to be able to attain to. And even better, if you can also do that with others. For 24 years now, I've been with somebody where we started out 24 years ago. And I would say without reservation that we were right away in a telepathic state with each other and it wasn't even a question. We didn't even have to discuss it or even marvel at it in a sense because it was so strong. And then that's been the constant throughout this time. That's a long period of time, 24 years. And in a way, it's the dominant chord because everything else kind of forms around that, at least speaking for myself. And what does that do for me, with me, with her, with everybody? Well, it gets me activated. It gets me to be full on in my destiny. And that's really what it's all about. So I'm going to pause here for a second and saying, here's a man who's saying, this is getting me to be full on in my destiny. I am full on in my destiny. And how many of us can claim that, that we're full on in our destiny? I would say for me that I am reaching and determining and intending to be full on in my destiny. But I'm pretty certain I'm not full on in my destiny yet. And I know very few human beings who could actually probably make that claim, right? And back to the transcript, I know that for many people, being full on in their destiny is not easy to attain to and to stay with, especially these days. And I know that Uranus in general isn't what it's cracked up to be because what happens is if you don't develop these subtle muscles, if you don't meditate or pray, if you don't read spiritually or do internal work, if you don't come to yourself in a qualitative full-on sense, it doesn't really happen. And it's so disappointing. It's so frustrating. It's so painful for people. I've been working that, with that with many people over the years. And usually people are pretty intuitive that I work with, but there's still this glitch, this handicap, you could say, this obstacle. Well, what is the obstacle? You know, let me take Sarah, for example, my ultimate twin, which was Elias's first wife. She was and is the most Uranian person in the, in the world. Absolutely super telepathic. And then what's the problem? And I want to pause and say, you know what? I don't know if Sarah was Elias's first wife. She might have been his second wife, but um, she was his wife. She was and is the most Iranian person in the world. Absolutely super telepathic. Well, then what's the problem? It was simply that she didn't accept and embrace who she was. And in Uranus land, that is almost immediately disqualifying because how can you tune in to these subtle energies if you're busy criticizing yourself or questioning yourself or doubting yourself all the time or doubting the reality of this or doubting the liability of that? It just dampens it tremendously. And I know there's someone watching this who's going to appreciate that sentence and I'm going to say it again. How can you tune in to these subtle energies <coughs> cleaner <laughs> if you're busy criticizing yourself or questioning yourself, or doubting yourself all the time, or doubting the reality of this, or doubting the liability of that. It just dampens it tremendously. And so, she had to battle constantly. Like what we would do together is we would enter into these telepathic spaces, and it would take her somewhere that would let her know that she was on the right path. And then she would kind of get caught in all these karmic struggles. But then that direct perception was so bright and so clear that she was, for me, truly a breath of fresh air all the time. And I know that I was for her. But for the moment, let's just say that every person I've been with since 1969 has been a major telepathic force. It's been an incredibly clear channel. What about me? Well, it's my strength. 
it's my passion, it's my truth. But what is it besides saying it's telepathic and all that? What is it? It's that I can see myself. I can see you. I can see us. I can see who we're becoming. I can see where I'm coming from. I can see and feel and know the nature of my quest. I can pursue it without constantly running it down. Most of all, I can connect up with beings of the inner who are on the same wavelength as me. And it's not just a matter of them telling me the truth and my writing it down or something. It's a matter of entering into a shared frequency, a deeply mutual frequency, where we're in that same space together and we're doing this dance. And when you're really in your honest it's a very joyous and liberating dance. So there's a heightened sense with it. And I admit that this heightened sense that I get when I tune in on whatever level, verbally, writing it down, whatever, that heightened sense is my lodestar. That's how I proceed. I need that heightened sense because I need to know that I know. I need to essentially unite with my future self. That's what it boils down to. And my future self is communicating with me and communing with me all the time. So I just have to take that in. His future self is communicating with him and communing with him all the time. And what that indicates is if that's possible for Elias Lonsdale, it's possible for all of us, right? Hmm. I wonder what that would be like. And I have learned to be in that flow, in that frequency, in that vibration. And to treat that not as possible or probable or wouldn't that be great, but actually as the very basis of everything. Now that's taken me a tremendous amount of time and energy and so on. But what it does for me, I hope I can convey this last part because it's the most important. What it does for me is it creates me co-creates me all the time. I'm not somebody who is the same person all the time, nor do I have any desire to be that way. I'm somebody who is constantly in the hopper of self-recreation, you know? And so in that self-recreation, in this heightened state of bright, expansive consciousness, I get to be somebody that I've known before. I get to be somebody who's on their way toward life after death. I get to be somebody who's in a communion stream with all these beings in this place that we call the Grail Castle. And I get to have that experience of that, not as suppositional, not as wishful, not as this is just exciting or something, but as the very fiber of reality. And I just want to note here before the last paragraph that Recreational, self-recreation, it's the same word as recreational. Recreational, recreational. So I'm just imagining into that. What would that be like to be self-recreating in a way that is recreational? And so that's how it all works for me. It isn't at all what people who are outside of this kind of consciousness would project it to be. It's not even trippy. It was once a long time ago. It's not even, it's not trippy. I don't even, I don't know what hyperstate. It's not a hyperstate. It's actually very, very free, clear, true. And it's me continuously participating in the creation and recreation of myself, of the world, of my wife, of everybody, including you. Whew, that's your honor. So that is the completion of tonight's transcript for the ninth holy night. I thank you all for joining me, whether you're live or you're watching this later. I welcome and please invite you to share your comments with me in the comment section on the page or to send me a private message. Um, 
and I will look forward to being with you tomorrow when we look at the solar eclipse at 22 degrees of Libra that's happening in the sign of Libra. So have a wonderful rest of your day, your evening, your afternoon, wherever you are and whenever you are on the planet. And I hope that this helps you to dive more deeply into the Uranian stream of not knowing who you are and coming to know who you are. Thank you so much and um, have a very blessed night, holy night.